didn't cool down in here. I wonder if someone adjusted that. That'll do. Ready? Two, one. Hello and welcome to The Wizard and the Priestess. I am Nola and my co-host is... Nice. Welcome everyone. We are going to continue on from our conversation that we started last week, just to go a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole of dis-ease and specify a few common dis-eases. I think we just want to get to the symbology behind it. Nothing happens for no reason, right? Yep. So we get people coming in clinically, but also loved ones with certain diagnoses, diseases and conditions and most 85% of the time statistically no one knows where it came from so it's all idiopathic mm. but it has to come from somewhere yeah. so this is kind of the anatomy of the diagnosis I would say cool. do, you <laughs> do you I agree with you Matt <laughs> do you see any um, well, what's the TCM take on disease in general? Like, is there a general one? Is there a... Well, it could be, I guess it depends how, but essentially the, the disease is imbalanced. So mm. anything that is out of balance has the potential to, to be, um, would be diagnostic. Mm. Um, but then, you know, whether it hits the pit, pinnacle of being actual disease on a, like a Western, mm. from a Western perspective, well, that's, that's up to... Yep. the person themselves, like how they are relating to the world around them and how that yep. imbalance is actually impacting them. So you could have someone that has a headache and be like, it is debilitating, it's so painful. Or someone else has some similarity to that headache, same positioning, same mm. whatever, and be like, oh, it comes and goes, it's no big deal. Mm. So that comes back to that thought and perception again, which mm -hmm. we've spoken about. Yeah time and time again but I guess um, yeah if you wanted to we're going to dive into a couple of specific diseases that are like a western terminology in terms of disease yeah just really common among our population yeah um, largely people they're on a lot of medication for these and there's allegedly there's only a way to manage it and I think it's important to at least acknowledge the fact that Western medicine, as good as it is as emergency medicine, as a culture, we tend to rely on it to keep us healthy. But doctors don't study health, they study disease. So can you, be, in Chinese medicine, can you be sick and healthy at the same time? Relative to the other, maybe. I don't think you can. I can imagine that you can be, well, you can't be sick and healthy at the same time. But I think you can have like, you know, that balanced swing of like, sure, sure. You know, well, like the homeostatic. Totally. System. So like I've got like, well I've got this little bit of sickness. Yeah. So like say, um, on a simple level, like uh, I feel pretty well throughout m the month, but on the day before my period, I am like um, symptomatic. Mm. I have all these different things, symptoms. When my period starts, it starts clotty or it starts poorly and I notice these things and then once the period has started the symptoms go and the blood flows and then everything seems fine throughout the cycle so we can have that idea that it's only that moment in time yep. that there is some form of imbalance or disease in some form in some form mm -hmm. however that from my perspective then we talk about health and then they'd be like oh you know well 28 days of the month I'm fine it's just that 29th day that actually or day one that actually yeah. impacts me. Yeah. And yeah, I would say that no, that's the whole cycle that is out and this is demonstrating to you that something's off. But from a Western standpoint, they would be like, okay, well, we'll just, um, you know. We need a prescription. Oh yeah, totally. Let's, let's, something. Well, let's just block the bleed from actually happening. Let's put you on a pill that will completely stop everything from happening. Mm -hmm. And so then we don't have no cycle, we have no connection. And no symptoms. And no symptoms. And actually, let's just touch on that and we might dive into this for a bit. But that idea that there's no symptoms mm -hmm. means that I'm healthy now. Mm -hmm. And that is like, that feels like of our day, 
I think, well, the pill was like obviously felt like this really powerful tool that we can now introduce and um, really nourish women and, you know, allow them to alleviate all their symptoms. And essentially, if we look at it from like another perspective, it's like, oh no, but because you don't have the symptoms that you did have, now you can just keep working and we can keep monetizing you and we can continue to make sure that you don't have babies and or too many mm. and um and we can ensure that you get back into the workforce as fast as possible mm. and to some that might feel really good you know like i can understand that from a perspective of like a corporate lawyer going you know what i don't really want to have children i'd love to enjoy my sex life still i'd like to um or i don't want to have children right now whatever that might be and i'd like to just be able to not have any symptoms be able to work consistently stay with the you know stay in my masculine, stay flatlined with 24 hour, you know, clock, rather than having to move with the moon, having to like flow and go ups and downs, peaks and troughs, and that impacts my way of thinking and my ability to function in my corporate job. Mm -hmm. So I can understand for them, this pill is like power. Um, but then what is what that power? Say, what's the cost yeah. of that power? So that's a really clear indicate uh, a really common thing that I see in the clinic time and time again of women young as 14. I had symptomatic periods, so we put, they put me on the pill. And personally, I went through that. Mm. Um, I tried a few different options, didn't just do the pill, but I think after six months of trialing these medicines, I was like- There's all different ones. Yeah, so yeah, there's so many different options in terms of medication. You yeah. can use an implant, which is a rod, um, there is like the the spirals, there's the copper spirals, there's the hormonal rings, um, there's like, yeah, the pill itself, which has an plethora of different options in the way, in the levels of progesterone and estrogen. Um, a plethora of symptoms too. Absolutely. And I guess at the end of the day, all of these medications are either tricking your body into believing something that's not true mm. or stopping something. So then there is no flow and you are literally creating stagnation in a body. Mm. And there is an idea that essentially we need eight years of that flow to then hit our peak. Mm. But if you are 14 years old, you've just come through two cycles mm. or seven year cycle. Mm. And then now we block the next 14. Yeah. And then we hope when we come off the pill at like late 20s, early 30s, we can just Magical have a baby. Yeah. And maybe it will, right? But then what's the implication of that on our children? And yeah, it is something that I can see in the clinic that women are being, you know, sold down the river, that this is fine and completely normal. Is it pushed on young women? I think if you have a symptomatic period yeah. at 14, 15 years old, 16 years old, it's debilitating. It's now impacting your ability to play sport, mm -hmm. to go to school, to do all the things that are system systematically meant to be able to be done. Yeah. Then yeah, I'd say it's probably the one and only cure all option. Right. Uh, I think that most women of this day and age may be waking up to it, but I know plenty of young women that have been put on the pill for at least Nowadays, at least, what I'm hearing in the clinic when I treated young women with metaragia, which is excessive bleeds, mm. really common for really young kids, yeah. um, especially as they come into um, their bleed for the first time, that now they're doing like, oh, we'll do this for three to six months. Yeah. Like there's a bit more of, um, I think the training that's coming out through GPs now is much more uh, relevant in the sense that we're not just going to put you on this and you don't just stay on it and continue for the rest of your life. We actually are going to check back in and assess. Now, whether that assessment is not, you know, yeah. just continue now for the next 10 years or whether that assessment is actually, okay, we're going to come off for two months and see how the symptoms have adjusted, see if there's any, any adjustment. Um, but, yeah, it is definitely that medication is one of those ones that has been... Um, yeah, whether it's pushed or not, I don't know, but it definitely is it's something that's been, it's recommended. Yeah. And like whether or not something's recommended, like pushed on you, if you were going to a doctor or a physician and you're asking for advice, you are going to take their advice as an authority or response, you're gonna take that information 
and use that responsibly and use that whether you use it responsibly or not like we hope that when people come in to see us that you know i hope for all my patients you know recently there's been a big movement of this um liberty and if you're listening patients i do want you to do the epsom salt foot soaks and i want you to do them regularly not every day but at least twice a week um so if you're listening you do. So right, like in that moment, I want you to. I'm here. This is my guidance. I want you. I want you to feel safe in this guidance. I want you to trial this and test it out. And I'll. I constantly will check back in and see if this is okay. But then again, when I'm working with someone, I like to see someone weekly, fortnightly, sometimes monthly if everything's functioning well. Mm. So it's there is these different layers in that. Um, I find with the. I mean, young, young women wanting to make it in the corporate world, especially that type of mm. personality, they're usually a prime candidate for something like endometriosis, mm. which is really a rhythm disorder, psychologically speaking. Physically, it's when the endometrial tissue grows outside and then makes its way into the abdominal wall, which is extremely painful. However, from, you know, you think of what, what's set that seed. You don't just get it, you don't just get stuff. No. So I think with a lot of pressure, <coughs> pressure of young women today, mm. they have to keep up with everyone and everything as well. And so do, so do young men. Absolutely. With guys, it's more kind of prostate, rectal related, sometimes bladder. But it's usually, it's always in that region. So it's usually too much pressure, not having their own rhythm and just not going with their natural flow, but not only physically, psychologically as well. They're still finding themselves who they are. But in our culture, we get told who we are. And I can't remember who said it. Is it Carl Jung or Joseph Campbell said, the world's always gonna ask who you are. And if you don't know, the world's gonna tell you without you in mind. Mm. And without you in mind of being so operative in that. Mm. Which is, I mean, look outside. It's so common. No one knows who they are. So, anyway. Yeah, it's ama amazing. And I guess, like, this wasn't really where we we're going to go today. But even with, like, that idea of endometriosis, and I would say I'm more likely to see someone in that corporate space with PCOS where they yeah. have actually turned off the feminine and they're more into that masculine mm. and because that driving force essentially like that the testosterone is heightened because we need to prove ourselves to be something that we are not mm. and therefore the feminine flow that keeps us in sync with it and in tune with our cycle actually is completely turned off and because of the drive and the like mm. and that can come from that you know that external like pressure of like trying to be good enough for someone else's i find a high ideology. correlation between anything to do with the ovaries or the uterus and growing up in a religious household 90 mm -hmm. percent of the time when you ask the right questions it always comes back to some kind of guilt because guilt around sex guilt around relationships mm -hmm. and you think of it at the time, it might at the time it might be like a a low level stress at the time, but then you think you would have learnt that in the first seven years where you've literally worn that quote unquote truth. It becomes literally becomes you. And then you have this unconscious program running the show saying that, oh, you did this when you were ten, eleven, twelve, whatever, and now you're gonna burn in hell. Mm -hmm. And people might think, oh, but I'm not religious. But you might not be religious consciously, but we're living in a Christian culture. And it's, you know, if you do these certain things at a certain time, you go to hell. Yeah. That's what I was taught. And I would say that even I would bring it back to what is that, right? So that's just authority. Yeah. So there's this feeling of whether or not you feel you're religious or connected to mm. that ideology, but it's more about that idea that feeling that someone in your air on in like is overstepping their authority mm. usually the father or the mother and they feel oppressed suppressed 
Totally. So then the three major things for children to be able to do is to be heard, to be seen, and to be able to express themselves freely. Yeah. So that's just like whether or not, yeah, it's like um, like those layers of all those things feels like it really comes, it does really come together in like unfortunate neat little package and then mm. the answer is to go on the pill which then takes us even further away from being yeah. one with with earth with cycles with the sun going up and the sun yeah. setting i mean the further you get from nature the sicker you get yeah so how do we get closer to nature now go outside <laughs> that's where the ultimate reality tv is it's um not on tv look out the window go out the window not through the window go out the door and see what you saw out through the window, I should clarify that. You just need to get skin on ground, on grass, get into some kind of water source and immerse yourself in that because it is you. We share our DNA with every plant, animal, insect on the planet. And I mean, what percentage are we water? Depending how you want to answer that, it can be anywhere from 55 to 99.9% water. What's that? Um, was it you telling me that about how um, they realised that we were, they did this big analysis of like our DNA and then they realised, like they did the big, um, they kind of broke down DNA and they realised there's 25,000 different DNA molecules or whatever and then we are literally we have the exact same DNA as a cockroach or a fly. Yeah. Is that you telling me that? Sounds like something I would say. <laughs> but it's like we're literally no, yeah. we're no more or no less than a fly or um, whatever the insect was. So it's just a bit of an indicator yeah. of that um, there are miracles around us everywhere in everything, and we are somewhat exactly like that. Uh, which well, just I think it's just a, like a different aspect of yourself, really. Yeah. We've evolved, depending on what model you want to subscribe to, but let's take the evolution theory. We've evolved anthropomorphically through the um, animal kingdom. So once you were that spider, that fly, or the dog, or whatever it is, that plant even. So that is you. And that's why some people feel such a strong connection to nature, because they acknowledge and they, they're tapped into that part of themselves. And that itself is a is a very powerful therapy. Mm. And I think there's something that this, I was just thinking of in terms of what you just said. Um, is that the DNA thing? No, it's not the DNA thing, I said is that. about the pyramid that we spoke of? Pyramid? Um, no, I was just thinking about um, in terms of that person that therefore is moving away. So what would you say is why, like, what is that? Is that just the fact? Like, is the reason we're moving away because um, I always bring it down to the cultural revolution of making more money and money being the like pride and joy of the monopoly. Yeah, I think it's not the only two of everything. I think. Because um, really, if we really like, if you really believed you were one with nature, and I had, oh, I had something to say about just the the magic of birth and seeing something as like simple as a placenta mm -hmm. and seeing how the tree of life looks like if you will look up at the sky and see a tree above you. Like the intricacies of all of that mm. detail is just, it's there in front of you, in your body, as a human growing a baby or Every birth. Self. So it's like, we are so, we are that, and it is that, right? Like you look at it and it's the same, so it can't not be yeah. um, interlinked, but it, I guess, like, what's that driving force behind being disconnected, or why would we want to be disconnected, or why is that so well, innate, okay and normal? Innately, I don't think it's normal. I think it's common. Mm. It's become quote unquote normal. Yeah. I think it's far from normal because, as we said last time, we've got more health specialists in the world today, yet we're sicker, sicker than ever. I think we compartmentalise life. We get told that we need the shiny car, the big house, the cars, the phones and whatever else. And if you don't have them, well, you're not cool, you don't fit in. And 
the more connection you have to that, the less connection you have to yourself because you're trying to be included in all that out there rather than what's going on in here. We're not taught that. No. We get taught what to think. We don't get taught how to think. So we're kind of, from that perspective, we're sort of doomed from day one. In terms of being sick and getting diseased? Not necessarily being sick and getting diseased, it's just the disconnection from self. But that's essentially where disease starts. Right. It's got to be a disconnect from the self. Yeah. So if you think of, you know, things like, how many diseases would you know or think about, if you were to think about it right now, are really symptomatic of disconnection from self and self? Yeah, I would say like everything is much everything. is is yeah. being is yeah in some way or form imbalanced caused so, by. So, so there's really two realities going on, two main realities, and I'm not talking dimensions or anything like that. You've got. I've spoken about time, space, space, time. You can correlate that to conscious and unconscious. Your conscious reality is picking up right now that this table's real, I'm real, that's there and that's solid, etc. That's what's happening consciously. You've got the brain road bridge between the conscious and un unconscious, which is the subconscious, which is the wisdom of the cells, 30 billion billion biochemical reactions a second, all your digestion, circulation, breathing, etc., etc. And you've got the unconscious. The unconscious holds every memory from conception till now. So if you, you're listening to me talk, mm. you're listening to me consciously, mm -hmm. sort of. <laughs> Maybe sometimes but, you're but you're not, you're not thinking about your 10th birthday. Oh, well, you are now. <laughs> but now that's, that's in the unconscious. So let's say something happened on your 10th birthday. Yeah, I got me a skip, 11am. Good. So, is that your choice? Okay. But let's say it wasn't your choice. Oh. Okay. Hypothetically. Okay. <laughs> but let's say, because I know parents who get their kids' ears pierced like two years old. No, less than that because I don't want them to scratch them and then get infected. Okay. Pick an age. <laughs> the, point, the, the point is they've consciously forgotten about it. But there is still a very detailed analysis of that event in their unconscious. Mm -hmm. The unconscious, to the degree it's got tension and trauma, and essentially you haven't um, you haven't given it any airtime. Yeah. You haven't. You just stuffed it down it's as a bad closet. Well, you don't know to express it. You're six months old. Well, you're you, then there's a, a thorn there in the side. Oh no. Okay. So I spoke about last time. It's not in the ears. Well, depends where you get pierced. Where are you getting pierced oh. in the side? I don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> Okay. So, I when I was 10. Good. You're now telling me that if I chose not that, it would be, it would be some kind of trauma. Or right? some sort of that yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah. So then you might have, you might, because it's that area of the body, you might develop a hearing thing. You might develop a, uh, some kind of suppression, lack of power, complex type thing. That can grow and manifest into any number of diseases, including cancer. Yeah, right. So before we go any further, interesting, because last time we were talking about the thorns that we create from our own thinking mind. Uh, and this kind of feels like it's bringing us into that idea of the subconscious, the unconscious becoming conscious through the, through the way of patterning and the way that we act out our life. And like I know personally, I have worked through like like layers of this, like I've taken up big coats in the last few years, just like becoming more and more aware yeah. of those patterns. And yeah, I think I've spoken about this. I had a friend who's, I'm like, why didn't you say anything? And she's like, oh, I don't think you were ready to hear it. Mm. And I was like, I was so ready. You could have just said something. And it's like, of course I wasn't ready at that point. That's where a lot of our triggers come from, right? Our emotional reactions. There's something oh, unconscious. Really? Could even be a smell, a sound. Some kind of sensation really? and then boom. Oh, I can smell, I have, off. I smell this, um, it must be formula yeah. that they serve in like the baby pen, uh, baby pen? 
Um, <laughs> well, when I was little, before I was tending shows to you, these yeah. kids, I was, well, for my family, I was put into daycare at a very young age. And so the baby pen being this yeah. little shoebox room that had like a few cots in it, yeah. and all the babies would sleep in that. I have like the distinct smell of the formula uh, they must have get fed us. Yeah. It's a really nurturing smell. It's gross, but yeah. like the actual smell is like yeah. quite off putting. But I have a really like good relationship with that smell. <laughs> but maybe not, right? Because it definitely awakens something in me mm. to like connect to. Have you just tried that? Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm like gooing and going in the bed. So if you're, let's go the opposite path of that. Okay. Like, did not have a good, you oh, don't have a good bad. relationship with it. No, but I'm saying now. Oh, and you, it comes up. Oh, the smell. Yeah. Like I didn't like the formula. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it comes up and you suppress it every time. Oh yeah, like I can't feel it. You're going to suppress it to such a degree that you're going to develop so much pressure, potential, most likely in the olfactory bowl, oh. or front of the brain. Is that where you get in those things? Matt puts this. Oh, um... Did I do it for you today? I did too. You don't have a few times. <laughs> Guys. Manipulate her um, first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve, just so we're clear. So he puts this. Um, Is that traumatizing for you? I mean, the experience was okay because it felt like a big release after you pulled the cotton bud okay. out of my Maybe nose. that's why you have a good relationship with that. <laughs> You're welcome. I, <laughs> I didn't have an issue with that smell. I'm just actually trying to run through consciously. Yeah. Um, because I am very memory, I've got mm -hmm. a good memory, obviously, whenever I love I am, 10th birthday, ears pierced. Um, <laughs> trauma! Did you ever talk about it? I feel good about yeah, it, it feels really good yeah. for me. Loved that day, I got a 20 bird too. Um, the, my point is that... Like an actual bird? Was it like a... No, it wasn't real, I wanted a real one. I got Tweety Bird. You know Tweety Bird? Like the cartoon? Yeah, yeah. Tweety Bird plush toy. Oh, yeah. I was so. I really liked Tweety Bird. I liked, yeah. loved the colour yellow at the age of 10. Um, anyway. We, we digress. <laughs> right, so what I was going <laughs> to just say quickly was that that I'm just thinking about, I don't really have a connection right now. I'm trying to think of a really, like a smell that really turns me off that should, like might not. The only thing I can think of is naphthalene mothballs. I know it sounds strange, but in our family, we have this running joke between me and my brothers because my mum thinks that when people react to naphthalene, have you ever smelled that? I don't know. Do you know what mothballs are? Yeah. Do you know what they smell like? I'm not consciously right now. Can't you just conjure it up? Yep. Okay. okay. Anyway, it's a terrible smell. It right. smells horrible. It's like, it's like a nana smell because obviously that's what they used to use in nana times. Yeah. And every time I smell that, it's like gross. My mum's like, oh, the only people that, there's a special gene that means that you respond to that. But it's it's actually not. Every other person other yeah. than my mother responds to the smell of mothballs. But my mum can live in a house of mothballs and have no response mm. to it. So I'm wondering if there's some mothball there. <laughs> Because it's like mothballs have a very distinct, very unwelcome smell yeah. to everyone. My mum and maybe my nan. Anyway, that's a lot. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's what I'm talking about with the two realities: There's right. the seen, the unseen. Right, conscious and unconscious. The in between being the subconscious. That's, the that's where you wear the unconscious, and then it gets projected consciously. So, would you say then that the subconscious is the is the piece where the patterns lie? Because that, to me, is where. Because that could be the bridge between the, con the unconscious and the conscious when we, you know, I didn't know that I was responding from a place of threat mm. when I would act in a certain way. Yeah. I didn't understand that, but I couldn't not act that way. And then slowly as I peeled back the layers or done the work as such, I started to see, oh, wow. Oh yeah, I felt threatened at two years old because of whatever happened at that point in time. And yeah, now yeah. I can see and understand that. More specifically, it's the hormonal system. They act as the subtle interface between the tangible and non-tangible, the seen and the unseen. Hormones essentially tell your body what to do, right? They're like the messages. Yeah. 
the un you know, yeah, this unconscious slash subconscious messenger, messenger system of the body. Unconscious, subconscious messenger system. So that's going to tell you to run away or fight or. Oh, so it's the two of them together. So the two of them together are essentially creating. Well, they all merge into one. There's no cookie cutter line. I saw oh, okay, line. I'm going to go there. I oh, saw good. a very good line. Now I'm in the conscious. Awesome. So that's a, a mistake. Even doctors make. They think the brain thinks. The body thinks. I don't think doctors particularly are thinking about the thinking at all. Well, I had I'm a conversation a with a doctor last week, and she's explaining to me where thoughts come from in the brain. And How did she describe it? And she, oh, it comes from this area of the brain, oh. and then that does this, and it suppresses that. And, this, and I thought, well, did that? No, that's not how it works. Show me one, you know, some site, evidence or data. Anything. And I haven't heard from her since. But um, <laughs> she was. <laughs> you really need to work on these Tinder dates. <laughs> <laughs> you really just screen through. Touche. <laughs> It was bubble, but uh, <laughs> please make oh, notes <laughs> of your uh, what is that called? Occupation. That's that's what that smell was. <laughs> oh, I can smell the mallow. That's actually something funny for you. Uh, mate, I'm, um, oh, mate, I'm. Oh, please. <laughs> Okay, so, so we've point, got our messenger system. So the point I was oh, making right. with all that was right. that it filters up, let's say it filters up, go down sideways, then how you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. It goes from the unconscious time space, filters through the subconscious, which is that bridge, and then it presents itself in space time, which is our conscious reality. Yes. How it presents with everyone is different. It's based on their genetics, it's based on their diet and lifestyle, how they process food, emotions, thoughts, etc. their spiritual beliefs are, all of these things mould that into what it could be. So think about the most, so I know it doesn't make a lot of earth logic sense, but think about it from like more a soul perspective, bigger picture. Okay? You, if you get headaches, let's say, Something's trying to tell you something. Right. At all, any given time. Yeah. yeah. So, what could that represent, do you think? Well, there's many, many things. The pressure in the head would be the most simple one. Yeah. So, pressure in the head, it could be maybe your, there's some intuition downloads you're ignoring. Yeah, right. The nudges. Yeah. So, these nudges manifest themselves physically. Mm. Now, it can be... Yeah. Can I just note on that? It's really interesting because headaches generally, like, the side of the head, mm -hmm. we think about that, and the gallbladder being the side of the head, mm -hmm. and then gallbladder correlating to the yes man people pleaser, yeah. and then what you just said in terms of... Um, what did you say? <laughs> I'm going to play the pregnancy. You're going to play that kind of... Oh, it... Of the suppressing... Intuition. Yeah. Because yeah. like if you, you have to suppress your intuition when you have when you have to please everyone around you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Um so headache continue now, now suppress let's say intuition. let's say you've suppressed all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Now to the degree you're let's just go with the yes yes man, yes man um mm -hmm. thing. So you keep saying yes, keep saying yes. That means every time you say yes to someone else you're saying no to yourself. Right. So, if that doesn't align with your belief system, mm -hmm. that's going to create a lot of friction. Right. So, you're going to build up that pressure, build up that pressure, suppress that emotion. Emotion is energy in motion, as we spoke about in our series, where the energy gets stuck yeah. or completely, it's either stuck and stagnant mm -hmm. or there's just nothing there. Yeah. So, then you get hardening of tissue. Then you add environmental toxicity to that. That's a prime candidate for cancer. Yeah. 
And over time, I mean, that's, that's where you're headed. Yeah, uh, but cancer is one of those things where it doesn't, there's no logic when it comes to cancer, because little babies and kids can get cancer for no logical apparent reason. We don't have that deeper from another time. But then it's one of those diseases that, depending where it's located, mm -hmm. like muscles don't get cancer. Bones do, blood does, brains and organs do. Right? Mm -hmm. So depending, remember what we spoke about the other week, let's say probably one of the worst ones, pancreatic cancer. Okay. Pancreatic cancer is the home of itself. Oh, that's right. So, okay. That whole third chakra, yellow energy ray center, is deficient or it's, it's either too much or too little. So there's already that thing that's literally eating away at you. Yeah, the piece of you that is it's people pleasing the people around you instead of really following your nudges and trusting yourself. Yeah. So you, th so you think the pelvic region, which is all about rhythm, then the abdominal, which is about self, the thoracic, which is about the heart, the throat, which is about how you communicate your truth, and the brain, which is all about processing information and, yeah. Are you going to bring that together or what are you just dropping out for? Well, it's processing information, it's processing intuition, but it's also gathering all of the information of your body. Right, from from the conscious, from, from that unconscious, subconscious messaging through to what we see in our conscious reality. Mm. So I guess uh, we'll just finish that up with that idea that what we talked about last time was that your thoughts have this implication on the body and how that can lead to a certain death. Yeah. Uh, whereas now we're kind of going that little bit deeper that, okay, yeah, but we all have this rhythm going on mm. and what may have happened Previously, is then going to implicate how things how things are um, expressed mm -hmm. in the physical. Yeah. Uh, I think next time we're going to go a little bit deeper into the specifics, maybe of cancer or some other debilitating diseases or illnesses that we yeah. see in the clinic, and how how we would essentially move with those or support how someone. We, how we can see that. How we can see it, it's and not. how we might support someone through an yeah. experience of that. So stay tuned. We'll see you next week. Have a great time until then. Thanks, guys.